Hi, this is Pod Save the UK. I'm Nish Kumar. And I'm Coco Khan. And this week we're asking, is the country going to rack and ruin? Plus, like Rishi Sunak, I'll be trying not to uh, crumble under the glare of Labour MP and arch interrogator, Sir Chris Bryant. So the Privileges Committee has accused seven MPs of trying to undermine and impugn its work. The Leader of the House has condemned this. Do you think that they should apologise to the House? Uh, I haven't actually gone through the report yet, so... You haven't read the report? Chris Bryant will be here on the day he's been promoted to a shadow minister job to tell us how he plans to save our parliament. Hi, Nish. Oh, you're not here again. What's happened? Where are you? Coco, I am in rural Wales. Mm. I'm in uh, glorious Brecon, where it is hotter than I've ever experienced (laughs) in Wales. (laughs) It's so weird. I, I'm filming uh, Hold the Front Page, which is the show where I go and pretend to be a uh, journalist at a local newspaper, as opposed to our podcast where I pretend to be a journalist <laughs> at a national newspaper. Oh, that's nice. What sort um, of stories have you done? Have you just been told to like routinely fuck off by everyone you ask for a comment? No, no, no. The 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 local news, they're very happy to see people from the local paper here. <laughs> oh, right. They're very excited. Yeah, yeah. I've done, um, yeah, we've Yesterday, we actually went to the auditions for the Christmas panto. Oh, wow. Uh, like an Amdram Christmas panto. It was really, it was a very nice, wholesome uh, afternoon. I will say that everyone we've run into uh, so far has said, thanks for coming to uh, Wales. Sorry it's so hot. <laughs> that, they all seem sort of vaguely perplexed by the state of the, <laughs> by the, state of the weather. Um, I'm going to attempt the Welsh pronunciation of where I am. Uh, it's Banai Brookinog, I believe. I... But if, well, Welsh-speaking listeners uh, can uh, definitely correct me. Um, how are you? How's your week been? Uh, when we finished recording last week's episode, I didn't think I'd ever be sitting here being like, oh, I can't wait to chat to Nish about concrete. So, I mean, ha- ha- are you excited to have a, this chat about concrete, Nish? I'll tell you what, I would love to go back to a time before I'd ever heard the term reinforced autoclaved aerated concrete. I would absolutely kill to return uh, to that time. But uh, talk about it, we must, because this is the uh, RAC scandal, R-A-A-C, about a cheap and lightweight type of concrete filled with tiny air bubbles that was widely used in the construction of public buildings between 1950 and 1990. Uh, the comparison that keeps being drawn with it because it's a cheap and lightweight concrete, and the reason it's cheap and lightweight is it is full of tiny air bubbles, is the comparison is a bit like an aero bar. Now, I don't know if anyone outside the United Kingdom is familiar with an aero bar. It was a chocolate bar that, was, uh, that felt lighter in your hand because it was full of air bubbles. But all you really need to know is at no point has anyone ever looked at a building and gone, wow, that building is strong like chocolate. It's not a comparison that suggests structural integrity. And if the gods of metaphor wanted to be any more heavy handed about the current state of the United Kingdom, it would have been simply impossible for them to do it other than to say that the schools have been made of concrete that's absolute shit and it's falling down potentially around our children. Uh, So the week the kids were supposed to go back to school, 147 schools in England have been affected so far. They've either had to close completely, shut some buildings or take other mitigating measures to ensure safety. And that number is expected to rise when the government publishes a new list in the next two weeks. Figures for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are still being compiled. Rishi Sunak himself has been put firmly in the firing line after a former senior civil servant pointed out that when Sunak was Chancellor, he halved the budget for school repairs in England in 2021 himself. Sunak hit back saying it is utterly wrong to blame him. Now, luckily for Rishi Sunak, and this may be the great silver lining of his tenure as Prime Minister, there is always someone willing to be more visibly incompetent that he could use as a human shield. Uh, And in this case, it's the Education Secretary, Gillian Keegan. Here she is in a widely circulated clip uh, after she finished an interview with ITV News, literally seconds after the official interview finished. Does anyone ever say, you know what, you've done a f- good job because everyone else has sat on their ass and done nothing? No, no, no signs of that. No. She later had to apologise for her language, and I guess it's a valuable lesson that we can all learn about 
not talking shit when you've clearly still got a microphone and camera in front of you. I really don't feel she should have been caught out by that. But what is even more unfathomable is that she did actually apologise for her language, but then she later told schools they need to get off their backsides and fill out a survey about whether they have unsaved concrete on site. So the message from Gillian Keegan is clearly, go fuck yourself. I'm so sorry. Please go fuck yourself. The schools are all closed. I'm not sure what exactly we're supposed to be thanking Gillian Keegan for. It's not really clear. But probably a more serious uh, situation that now faces her is that today the Daily Mirror has reported that a company called Centerprise, of which her husband Michael is a non-executive director, was awarded a £1 million IT contract from the Department for Education, with that money coming from the same pot of cash earmarked for rebuilding schools. So it just, it always goes to show that no matter how bad the situation is, someone affiliated to the Conservative Party has made good money. <laughs> so before we get any trouble, we should probably say that the Department for Education has said that uh, ministers have had no involvement in the procurement process for these contracts. Uh, they were awarded in line with existing, existing government commercial procedures. So just want to try and save you from another article in The Spectator, Nish. <laughs> so. Listen, if you shit on your own front garden, it's not illegal, but it doesn't look great. So the government put out a graphic to reassure people saying, look, most schools are unaffected. But Labour took the piss with a spoof graphic referencing Jaws saying that, well, you know, most most beach goers are not eaten by a big shark either. Everybody's really uh, taken to social media, which is... uh, of no fucking use to anyone. <laughs> like, I, I just, it's just one of those things where I think I just, it's a personal frustration of mine where this instinct now to immediately like put out a sassy tweet, you just go fucking do something. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. I, don't, I, I, I sort of don't care how strong your meme game is. There's bits of like cloud based concrete falling on kids' heads. Okay. I think that's fair enough. Well, actually, no, the, 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 you do raise a really important point there because, you know, Labour have known about this problem as well. This problem has been going on for a really long time. There is a question to be answered about who is exactly to blame. Yeah, I mean, listen, this has been a problem that has been coming down the pipe for an awful long time. There's been various audits and various sort of schemes over the last few years that have slowly discovered that this material that we were using really up to 1990 to build a lot of public buildings has really, really serious concerns around it. I think the difficult thing for the Conservative Party, as with all of these issues, is it's very, it's all well and good to say Labour didn't do anything about it, but the Conservative Party has been in charge of the country for 13 years. It's an awful long way to reach back to try and particularly finger the blame at anyone else other than their own organisation. A BBC investigation found that at least 13 schools confirmed to have RAC had funding to re- rebuild withdrawn in 2010. They've been approved for rebuilding under a Labour scheme and then were later scrapped by the Conservative-led government. It, it feels like one of the consistent things that we look at whenever we're trying to talk about the problems facing in the United Kingdom, a lot of them can be rooted back to the early years of the coalition government. Uh, we, uh, some chickens are coming home to roost from the kind of early Cameron era. It's once again worth suggesting, is there some sort of scheme where we can force David Cameron and George Osborne <laughs> to sit in rooms entirely made of reinforced concrete <laughs> and, just, and just allow them to consider their positions in history. Hospitals, of course, can be the next big problem. NHS England has told hospitals to be ready to evacuate if buildings crumble. Um, and there's a unbelievable nugget in the Financial Times this week where they uh, highlight that Hinching Brook Hospital in Cambridgeshire has confirmed that since 2020, it had to confine the treatment of some heavier people to the ground floor owing to concerns about the state of the building. What a metaphor for the Britain that we live in. Yeah, I mean, this kind of short term is thinking about the obsession with saving money in the short term, the obsession with, uh, you know, uh, within an electoral cycle, trying to balance your budgets without considering what destruction that might wreak five, 10 years down the line is the kind of thinking that has trapped Britain in this kind of state where it feels like the entire country is falling down around us. I regularly buy vintage clothes and I can say for sure that clothes being made in the 70s they're just waiting to be set on fire. Those clothes are, <laughs> those are not good materials to be. So I accept that, you know, things have changed in the in the the progress of material design through the years. But I mean, 
even back then those decisions were made about this it's just doing it on the cheap do you know what I mean and there's always that classic thing they always say like oh buy cheap buy twice this is a thing that we know about good money management and it's I appreciate this is a legacy problem, but this is a we're all we're all part of this weird drug about buying cheap, and uh, it's actually not the right approach. When I say we, I don't mean me. I mean <laughs> the government. When, when yeah. Coco says we, what she means is she's currently wearing a jacket that's made of a rack with an asbestos lining. <laughs> It'll be like a really groovy 80s jacket that if I stand out in the direct sunlight, will just explode. (laughs) That's what it will be. Um, Most of the costumes in the film Working Girl were made of asbestos. People don't really talk about that now. It it was very dangerous. No, of course I'm joking. (laughs) I just needed... I just... Okay, I'm glad we confirmed that. (laughs) I want to start talking about the reshuffle now and I'm kind of loathe to do it because actually what does it matter who is in the, uh, the in the post as long as if what they do they say they're going to do they actually do it do you know what I mean but nonetheless reshuffle we are at uh, Keir Starmer has been busy it's a generally been a well received shuffle um, and it has seen a Starmer strengthening his support he's packed his top team with centrists at the expense of the soft left one MP was reported as saying even Tony Blair didn't have this many Blairites in his cabinet I don't know how this affects their electability. But my concern, once again, is is the Labour Party proposing 1997 solutions to 2023 problems? And that's the key idea that I keep returning to. My concern is if the Blairites are planning to reheat Blairism, we might all end up with a bad case of food poisoning. Honestly, mate, like at this point in life, I'm just like, I don't care about the label. Just do the bloody job. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I just don't. Yeah. Um, but, you know, on the subject of that, you know, we had the uh, the pleasure of having uh, Labour MP Rosanna Allen Card join us on the sofa. We had a great time talking to her and she laid out an, a really genuinely moving vision for what mental health could be. Um, and she assured us that that plan would be stuck to. So we were very alarmed to see that she has uh, returned to the backbenches after resigning as shadow minister for mental health. Um, she argued in a very dignified resignation letter, one that we haven't seen for quite a while, that the fact that this position was not going to be taken into the cabinet made her feel like these commitments weren't being taken seriously and she wouldn't be part of it. I hope that is not the case um, and that actually the commitments will exist even if the role doesn't, but it, it doesn't fill you with confidence. I mean, here she is uh, chatting to us in an earlier episode. Having an open access mental health hub, getting people the treatment when they need it because prevention is more important. And, and we know people get sicker the longer they're waiting. But also what we're saying is, is that we would have um, specialist mental health support in every school. And it, it is bold. And I, I understand that that people are at breaking point now. They, they don't believe the cavalry are coming. But I wouldn't be sitting here and I wouldn't have had this brief for three years and still be in it if I didn't believe in it and I didn't believe that we were going to bring about a change. Yeah, um, I mean, it it was very powerful and it felt very moving to be sat opposite her when she said that. And it does deeply concern me that this is something that's not going to be a priority for any future Labour government Um, given that, you know, there is a kind of slowly exploding mental health crisis that's been exacerbated by the impact of the pandemic. Um, And I can't imagine that generation of young people that had to stay at home, be trapped indoors, miss out on a huge chunk of their development, and has now gone back to school to find out bits of it are falling down around them, is going to be a generation that isn't going to need mental health support. But it's not even just young people, older people is everybody. Uh, It does... I do find it sort of deeply concerning. I think at some point we need to know specifically what the Labour Party is going to do in office, because at the moment it's just a blizzard of um, policy announcements that negate previous announcements. Like they're basically just, they've walked back on a lot of stuff and at some point we're actually going to need Keir Starmer to spell out a positive vision for this country that isn't, if I may borrow an old line from the sitcom 30 Rock, make it 1997 again through either science or magic. (laughs) I mean, hopefully we'll get some answers on that because coming up next, I'll be speaking to a Labour MP who was handed a shadow ministerial job by Keir Starmer. Sir Chris Bryant will be here to tell me how the first PMQs of the new parliamentary term went and to explain all about his plan to save UK politics. 
Feel like you're missing out because it seems like everyone is either starting a side hustle or becoming their own boss? And you know what they're hearing a lot? It's the sound of another sale on Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your own business. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. They cover all your sales channels. There's a shopfront-ready POS system to its all-in-one e-commerce platform. Shopify even gets you selling across social media marketplaces like Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And thanks to 24-7 help, with an extensive business course library, Shopify is ready to support your success every step of the way. Sign up for a £1 per month trial period at shopify.co.uk slash podsavetheuk, all lowercase. Go to shopify.co.uk slash podsavetheuk to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.co.uk slash podsavetheuk. So it's good news in the Labour reshuffle for my guest, Sir Chris Bryant. This morning, he was appointed Shadow Minister for Creative Industries and Digital Working. Congratulations, Chris. Sounds like a cool job. It sounds very cool. Yes, I'm very excited. But I'm slightly um, uh, discombobulated, I guess is the best word. Uh, I, you know, I had to do a debate. This I had to lead for the Labour Party on the, in a debate this afternoon on digital infrastructure and all I know about digital infrastructure really um, stems from about the year 2010. <laughs> well, I'm quite surprised by that because I've been reading your book, uh, Code of Conduct, and we are going to talk about it properly in a moment. But... Am I meant to wave it at you now? <laughs> yeah, like I mean, uh, listen, we're all a fan of a grip and grin here at Pod Save the UK. <laughs> um, but I'm interested in that because you talk specifically about ministers being appointed roles where they don't necessarily know about it. Quite right. Um Tony Blair came, but apparently when he was doing a reshuffle, that these are very chaotic things normally. And yeah. sometimes they put, um, there's one time when they put all, they had all the names of all the jobs that they wanted. This was when we were in government. And they put post-it notes up with the names of all the people on them. Um, and then somebody opened a window and they all got blown off. So people, just, all the, <laughs> and then they got, oh, I can't remember. Who's doing justice again? And then, but then the, the much worse instant, which I do talk about in Code of Conduct, the book, is that is. Um, Tony came off the phone call having um, appointed somebody as a new health minister. And he said, I'm sure that person was, you said that person was a man, <laughs> but I'm fairly certain I've just appointed a woman. <laughs> and he'd appointed, he had indeed appointed um, the wrong Johnson. So Alan right. Johnson then had to get a different job entirely. I mean, your book is full of amazing anecdotes. I'm, I was surprised by how much we have in common. We both like RuPaul and we both seem to have... Like? <laughs> like? Okay, all right. We love, we're fans. Wash we're fans. your mouth out, woman. <laughs> I like that you um, refer to, you know, that very positive slogan of RuPaul's, you know, if you can't love yourself, how can you love... But, and not the one which uh, refers can to... Can I get an amen? <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's a really important thing about... Well, anybody in life, and actually, if you wanted to get very religious, it's mm -hmm. also a, it's a Christian. It's you know, um, it's it's what's what's behind Christianity as well is that you have to love yourself to be able to love others. But and and it says, love your neighbour as yourself. I just meant Chris. There's other RuPaul slogans that do apply to Westminster, like "Don't fuck it up." That seems I've like a good I've used that. <laughs> I used that in the standards committee once. Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> okay, so we're keeping some good standards. I but mean, I did it as don't. Oh, I see. Of course, of course. We wouldn't do swearing. Well, we have to have standards. But, um, well, yes, <laughs> also known as doing a Gillian Keegan. Exactly, exactly. I just want to go back to us and the things that we have in common. One, RuPaul. And two, uh, we have both, at points in our career, it's been mistaken for younger people. Another great story that I think our listeners need to, to oh, hear. Oh, yes. This is another Tony Blair. Tony had a series of reshuffles. He used to have one every year. Mm -hmm. And... After this, I'd been in Parliament for two or three years and he called me in after a reshuffle because everybody had been predicting that I would get a job. It was a bit weird. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't. And so Tony called me and he said, uh, Chris, well, you know, um, it's terribly difficult, but, you know, uh, next time, definitely. That um, was chilling how good that was. Thank you. And a year later, I can do May West as well. And a year later, um, he uh, called me in again after another reshuffle in which he hadn't given me anything. And he said, uh, uh, Chris, well, you know, definitely next time. And I said... Um, and he said, you look um, miserable. I said, well, yes, Tony, because to be honest, you said this last year. He said, oh, did I? Um, sorry, it's moving into King Charles now. And <laughs> uh, and he uh, and he then said, but, but Chris, you've got your whole life ahead of you. You're in your early 20s. And I said, Tony, I'm 43. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, he must be buzzing now. Was it the so, same situation? 
No, very different. So what tends to happen is that the top, top jobs are done by the prime minister or the leader of the, op, uh, uh, or the, leader of the party. And then the next sort of tier of jobs um, is done by the um, chief whip. And so in my case, it was the chief whip that rang me. And um, I'm delighted because it, it, you're, you're absolutely right that, that quite often one of the problems in Parliament is that people get, you know, you, you put a square peg in a round hole and you have right. somebody who knows absolutely nothing about the subject. I, but in this case, I was on the Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee for four years. I used to work for the BBC. I'm so proud of the creative industries in the UK because I think they're the biggest source of possible growth economic growth, they're about jobs, they're about imagination. And you know, just one thing, I, 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 somebody was asking me the other day, why do you read novels so much? And I said, well, because it's the only way that you really get to walk in somebody else's shoes. Well, it's genuinely lovely to hear you talk about that because, you know, we care a lot about the arts on this show. Uh, a few episodes ago, we had a whole episode about the nightlife economy. And we were talking about the just the revolving door of culture secretaries. Ah. I mean, who actually loves culture if you only stay in the role for a year? And also what kind of culture and what types of culture? And is that wrapped up in class? Is it wrapped up in race? And what might it be? So it's yeah. really lovely to hear all those things. I absolutely agree. I think they've had 11 culture secretaries in 10 years. I think it might years. be more. I think it's 12 and 13. Oh, it? it's, it's roughly a, in it's that. And that for all we know, another one's yeah. bit in the dust today. Um, and it does matter. I tell a story again in the book about how I, I, there's a tunnel in my constituency, well, from my constituency to another constituency in South Wales. It used to be a, a railway tunnel and we want to open it up and turn, turn it into a tourist attraction and, oh, and allow bikes through it because it would make it the second biggest um, uh, bike track um, tunnel in Europe and it'd be brilliant. Um, we need support from the government to do it because mm -hmm. it belongs to the Westminster government. I cannot tell you how difficult it has been to get a meeting with the right minister because the, the ministers keep on either s being sacked, resigning, unresigning, being promoted, moved to another department. And just when I'm about to get something resolved, they move. And, and that is one of the problems, I think, of government in the last few years. We, ministers change far too much. The book, by the way, is called Code of Conduct, Why We Need to Fix Parliament. Um, I actually listened to the audiobook version, Chris. And how was I? It, you know, animated. <laughs> is that good? I think it's, it's the first time I've read it. I've written other books as well. It's the first time I've I've done it for myself. But I think normally... it's a good way to do it. I think it is right. a good way to do it. Can I can I be honest with you? I have maybe it's just being a whatever. No, just don't a... be honest with me. If you're going to be horrible. <laughs> I thought you liked honesty yes, in no, politics. Of course what I you do. said? You Sorry, read the whole book on it. I'm teasing. Okay, okay, okay. But you know, maybe it's just my like disaffected millennialness. But I have desired big ideas. The notion of the big idea is something that really appeals to me because yep. I feel like small ideas yep. are not going to do anything. But actually, you're in your book, Code of Contact. Obviously, cumulatively, it is one big idea. But what I noticed was that it, oh, it's all quite reasonable, isn't it? Oh well, yeah, you could do that. Yeah, why not do that? It wouldn't take long. Yeah, just do that. I think reasonable is a good thing. I say in the book quite often, look, um, I may not be about to please you. I may be about to disappoint you because you may want may want an absolutist position. But I've never been a fundamentalist in my religion, in my politics, in my support for the Welsh rugby team um, <laughs> or anything else. I'm open to persuasion. But the one thing that I think that is really important is... Um, what I call the, our system has very few checks and balances. Once you become prime minister, you can do pretty much you, what you want as long as you maintain a majority in the House of Commons. And I call that, to quote Abba, the winner, ta the winner takes it all. Thank you, thank you. You're standing <laughs> small. Um, but it, that is, is what it is. And I think it's problematic. I think it makes, it makes ministers too arrogant. It yeah. makes them uh, try to protect their own position. It makes them abuse their power. And I think that that will be a big change. I mean, one of the points that really stood out to me is when you talk about, like, you know, why trust in politics matters. And it's because, you know, obviously the relationship between the, the citizen and the state, the voter and the politician, that matters. But also just globally, if everyone realises that we're all run by cronies, we'll lose our canary wharf city slicking high end status that we have around the world. Like it could genuinely have a whole range of impacts that we hadn't really thought about. I, look, I think the, the UK should stand for and historically has stood for a, f a few things. Um, the rule of law, the fact that um, nobody's above the law, including prime minister, as we've recently shown. Yeah. Um, the fact that you uh, your property is protected, um, that uh, your word is your bond, that we're really good at selling, to telling, selling Tories, S telling stories. <laughs> 
<laughs> I know some people that are good at selling Tories. <laughs> well, I think they've been selling themselves. <laughs> well, they've sold out anyway. And, and I want to reinforce those things because I think otherwise people go, well, hang on, what is the point of the well, United Kingdom? Well, it's, it's weird because, you know, going back to the thing about the desire for the big versus the small, you know, I'll be quite transparent. I would like to see things a little... I'd like to see the nationalisation of the railways. I'd like to see more public spend. These are things I'd like to see. So you don't really think that much about how people can just say shit in Parliament and that is allowed. And actually, these things do kind of all add up because it speaks to basically the voters' voice being diminished because of how... Because of these processes in which you can just say what you like, do what you like. So sometimes I think that, you know, the big positions that people might adopt, for instance, about um, nationalising the railways, yeah. um, or, or better one, actually, nationalising the water companies. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, all right? right? So I live in Wales. Uh, my constituency is in Wales. Uh, the water company in Wales is a not-for-profit company. I think that is a much better model. Wow. So some people would say you, you either have nationalised um, uh, water companies or you have privatised Are you ones. swimming in sewage, though? I'm uh, no, no, <laughs> okay. we're not. I just it's, to... it's better. Okay. I mean, there is an issue when you have very, he- very heavy rain about what uh, discharges. But we've learned today that there have been discharges in England in rivers when there hasn't even been exactly. any rain, and, yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. when you go. I'm sorry, this is a system that is bust. Um, so I, um, but my point is basically. Sometimes there is a third way. There are alternatives which might work better. So they still protect the public good. It's in the public interest, um, but they are, they're, they're just more effective. I just mean that, like, you know, when there is a public desire for things, sometimes it feels you communicate with your elected leaders and they don't listen and they don't have to. You're right there. But look, um, in the end, we have a democracy, which means that people get elected and they are charged with doing their job for a period. I think five years is too long. Um, As I say in the book, I think it would would be better if it were four. In Australia and in New Zealand, it's three. Um, We're long compared to other countries in the world. In the United States of America, if you're a member of Congress, you have to stand for election every two years. So there's an argument for, um, for shorter election periods. But in the end, how do I, for instance... I read a poll the other day which said that the majority of people in the UK are in favour of the death penalty. I'm passionately opposed to the death penalty. I would I would go on the barricades to fight against the death penalty. I, it doesn't work. It's not a deterrent. So what should a, an elected MP do if their constituents want the return of the death penalty? It, should they go, yeah, OK, right, I'm now in favour of the death penalty? Or do you want politicians who have some things that they believe in and they go to the electorate and the electorate goes, well, I like this bit and I like this bit and I like this bit. I don't like that bit, but I'm still voting for you. Fine. Well, I, that, I think, is, is, is kind of how democracy works. And sometimes when you're part of a team, you have to go, all right, this isn't my preferred direction of travel, but I'm going to buy it. One of the stories I tell in the, in the book is about George Eustace, Tory MP, who, when he was a minister, um, it said, what a wonderful deal we were striking with um, New Zealand and Australia, um, free trade deal. Um, and the moment he stopped being a minister, he said, it's a terrible deal. Oh, now, that, that's a point where you can't start to think, well, actually, wouldn't you be better off um, saying, I'm sorry, I'm resigning because I don't think it's a good deal and so I'm out. But then he would have had no effect over the policy. I wanted to show you a clip of PMQs today and oh. I, it was great to see the fire in the house. The truth is, this crisis is the inevitable result of 13 years of cutting corners, botched jobs, sticking plaster politics. It's the sort of thing you expect from cowboy builders saying that everyone else is wrong, everyone else is to blame, protesting they've done an effing good job, even as the ceiling falls in. The difference, Mr Speaker, is that in this case, the cowboys are running the country. Isn't he ashamed that after 13 years of Tory government, children are cowering under steel supports, stopping their classroom roof, falling in? No more. Just seriously, I will calm down. First session, I understand people are excited to be back at school. Will we expect better behaviour? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, this is exactly the kind of political opportunism that we've come... Exactly the kind of opportunism that we've come to expect from Captain Hindsight over here. What did you think of that there? Do you think that this is... um... 
the kind of jeering, the needing to be told to simmer down. Is that is that fine? Is that appropriate? I hate all of that argy bargy at Prime Minister's questions. And it's much worse at that and uh, and sometimes at the budget as well. I mean, it's awful. I, it, it, um, somebody once said, if, if you wouldn't be allowed to do it in a classroom of 13 year olds why are you allowed to do it in the chamber of the house of commons so i would i would want to change it and um i one simple thing we could do the questions at prime minister's questions are different from any other day of the week when we mm-hmm. also have questions to ministers because they're not on specific subjects they, they can be about anything and i think that 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 denigrates the nature of the debate so i would th- that's one of the things that i would change i note instantly mm-hmm that later on, it, you didn't play Rishi Sunak's response, but he he lied to the House. He said that Keir Starmer had never raised the matter of crumbly schools, which he did in June. There's clips everywhere and now going around showing that he did. And I bet you that Rishi Sunak will never correct the record. The one thing above all else that voters hate is MPs lying. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, look, uh, to be fair, sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes you say million instead of billion. We, we make mistakes. And, and sometimes it's because you legitimately thought that this was the case and you proved it to be wrong. We have a system in Parliament for ministers to be able to correct the record and it actually goes back digitally to the original and corrects yeah. it um, and says this has been corrected. But that's only available for ministers. But it should be available to all MPs. But more importantly, if a minister refuses to correct the record when they've been categorically told by, for instance, the UK Statistics Authority mm. that what they're saying is untrue then I think they should be out on their ear. But, you know, the lie's already gone around the world. It's already been replicated in the media. So what do we do about that? Well, indeed, I mean, that's difficult. But um, I tell you this, when you're forced to apologise to the House of Commons, Mm -hmm. and I've had to do it on occasion (laughs) because I can be an naughty boy, um, the... um, when you're forced to apologise, it does make you think twice then about it, the future. And I, I, and all I want is ministers to think twice before they tell fibs. Well, you tell me, is part of it sometimes having to say, I suspect some, so-and-so has done something and then, then it's in, investigated. And actually, even in saying that, is that not... You know, Nigel Farage has basically been online today, shortly before you arrived, saying that you accuse him of things and it was very bad and therefore you should not be made a shadow minister. I don't know if you come across this. No, you're telling me something completely and utterly new. Right. Um, but I have corrected the record in, in relation to Nigel Farage. It's in the Hansard for the 19th of July. So anybody can check and I'm sure he has. Well, well, exactly. And so, of course, I want uh, politicians to be held to account. But I wonder, is there a concern that if you can't say certain things that... Well, I mean, the incident I was specifically thinking there was about Dawn Butler, who, you know, said that Boris Johnson was a liar and was seems to be quite punished for that. But she turned out to be correct. And I wondered if a tightening of the rules might actually mean that, you know, Dawn Butler's assertion there, there'd be even less of them and that would make Parliament worse. You know, people should be able to be looked straight in the eye and said, hang on a minute. Order, order, order. Can you please, please reflect on your words? and withdraw your remarks. Deputy Speaker, I've reflected on my words and somebody needs to tell the truth in this house that the Prime Minister has lied. Under the power given me by standing order number 43, I order the member to withdraw immediately from the house for the remainder of the day's sitting. Yeah, so the, this is one of the things, again, I think is we're going to have to change. So we have a rule that you can't say anything, you can't call another member of parliament anything that implies that they're dishonourable. So you can't call them a coward, um, you can't say that they're lying you, um, and, and various other things. So, so and on, in one sense, that is good because it takes some of the argy-bargy and the kind of name-calling out of the system. That is good. Mm. But on the downside is when you know... And it is self-evident that somebody has lied. You should be able to say that. And we and we had this weird situation in relation to Dawn Butler. That Dawn accused um, uh, Boris Johnson of lying. Everybody knew he'd lied. Boris Johnson knew he'd lied. He'd been sacked multiple times for lying. And what happened? She was the person who was thrown out of the chamber for the day. Now, she knew that that was going to happen. Mm. Um, and in a sense, she was making a point and she made it very effectively. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think that rule has got to change. I think it's good that, you know, pe- people aren't name calling. And I, I think, you know, you are setting an example to people about how we should conduct ourselves. And if, you know, if, if you can't swear in a workplace, as you say, why should you be able to to do it there? But it is fascinating, as you put in 
in your in your book. You talk about. I'm you sorry, know, but if you did just allow a free for all. I mean, in the words oh, of the of Sugar Babes, that is a one-way <laughs> ticket to a madman destination. Of course, I've got, but it is, it is I just mad- wanted to get Sugar Babes in. <laughs> Sorry. Um, bit obsessed with Sugar Babes. Oh, really? What's your favourite tune? Is it that one? Oh, yes. Do, how do you feel about Heidi joining? Improved well, it, I think it's like the original team? lineup. Okay, I, I'm yeah, yeah. A very much team an original won. lineup person. <laughs> yeah. We went to see them in Bristol last year, and weirdly, we just got to stand in the corner, and there was another Labour MP standing next to me. <laughs> wow, yes, I had no I idea. Know. Well, I mean, the, the point that you make in the book as well is, you know, so many things in, in Parliament are done on gentlemen's agreement, and that idea of gentlemanliness and, and the name, the lack of name calling kind of speaks to that. And on the one hand, that sounds really wonderful, but of course, what happens when people aren't gentlemen in real life? Well, as we've seen, Seen in this parliament. I mean, yeah. that's, you know, what prompted me writing the book in the first place was um, this, in, in many regards, this is the worst parliament we've ever had because we've had, well, when I wrote it, it was 21 and then 22, and now it's 23 members of parliament who have been suspended for a day or more or have left before a report into their misconduct came out. And that is really problematic. You know, lot, quite a few people who've got into parliament in, in recent years just are not mm. gentlemen. They're not. Uh, and you, so you can't rely on gentlemen's agreements. I'm, I'm sorry, there's casual sexism in this. Well, yes, fine. But, but, but it, it makes a point, really, about what, what it, you, you know, everything relies on what it used to be like. It's, it's just like when I first arrived in Parliament, it was not uncommon for an older male MP to slap a, a younger woman MP's backside or to grab them um, or to hug them in a way that they didn't want to. Um, and in those days, we just used to brush all of that under the carpet. And I'm really glad that now we've got a system, the Independent Complaints and Grievance Scheme, which means that you can report people for that and it will be investigated and people have been thrown out of Parliament for sexual um, uh, harassment of their staff. Well, one of the headlines in the book that is, is you too have experienced that yourself. I mean, what what, what course did you have to, to have this investigated back then? Well, none back then. Um, and, and of course, uh, lots of people who have been, uh, because all of these are, in my cases, they're all more than 15 years ago, um, uh, and a lot of people, of course, have, who have been um, either groped or abused or whatever, or harassed, ha- go through a very complicated process of deciding whether or not to report, even when they, when there's a fully confidential system. Mm. And I get that. And I, I, I think it's wrong for us to try and force people into because uh, into making allegations yeah. um, or reporting stuff because who knows what's going through their mind and, and their heart and, and so on. Um, uh, but... Today, it's very different. Well, I mean, is it that different? Because we're also looking at news stories with, uh, you know, Tory MP Chris Pincher. Look, the the truth is that um, Chris Pincher groped two men. Um, It was particularly bad because um, he was a very senior person in the Mm. government, Deputy Chief Whip. Um, the people concerned said in their statements uh, that they they were very conscious of his position, and that bit then becomes an abuse of power Absolutely. as well as the as as the grope element. So you know, I mean, I, I'm not a prude. I I I people can have sex with whoever they want to as often as they want, or as infrequently as they want, and with as many people in the room as I don't care, <laughs> as long as it's all completely consensual um, and, and informed consent. But do you think that the way the case was handled was handled correctly? I'm just wondering, yes. I, I'm trying to get a sense of, is Westminster improving on this? Do you yes, believe? definitely, definitely. 15 years ago, he, somebody would have said, somebody would have just taken him into a corner and said, that's terribly bad. And bearing in mind, you know, a few years ago, one of the reasons Boris Johnson fell from power in the end was over the Chris Pincher case, because he said that he didn't know um, anything about previous allegations about Chris Pincher, and it turned out he did. He'd been directly informed of them. So we know that in the past, these things were sort of um, mm. brushed under the carpet and now they're not. I think, and I was really pleased, so he appealed our decision. So my committee said he should be suspended for eight weeks. If you're suspended for more than 10 days in, from Parliament now, um, you can face a, a by-election. Um, and uh, we knew that when we we gave that the, that sanction of eight weeks. He appealed that to the new appeal body that we set up and they decided that we had behaved impeccably. Because mm. th- there are two sides to this, which is on the you want to make sure that everybody gets a fair hearing and due process as an MP when you're... Because otherwise anybody can make yeah. allegations about anybody at any all the time. Um, but you also want to make sure that Parliament is a safe place for everybody to work. One of the things you uh, is a suggestion that you make in your book is about um, having security cameras around 
Um, the lobbies. Right. Yeah, and I, I was a bit taken aback by that for two reasons. One, I don't know how I feel about security cameras in general, so there's that. Right. Yeah, but yeah. also, you know, I, I wonder if it's like that's sort of not how bullying and sexual harassment works. Quite often it happens in closed doors. Yes, sure. Look, well, one of the problems in Parliament is the building was built in 1850 or opened in 1850 after the fire of 1834, and it's just full of nooks and crannies. Mm. And nearly everybody is in an office behind, you know, uh, oak doors with one other member of staff. And that is God. problematic. Yeah, that doesn't sound And on sound top of great. that, as I tried to explain in the book, on top of that, you've got a system of patronage of, and of power. Quite a few, because we are, the, the salaries that we're able to um, pay staff are, are really pretty mean, mm. I would argue. Um, quite often, these are staff who've just come out of university. It's their first job. They're quite vulnerable. I would say equally so for um, gay men as for anybody else. And all of that makes quite a toxic mix. Mm. Um, added, to, And then on top of that, you've got long working hours. I'm going to go back to Parliament now. I, I was in Parliament this morning at eight. I'm, I'll be finishing tonight at nine. Um, that All of that is just not great. So, I mean, your your book outlines many, many recommendations. You know, you look at Did the House Did it wind of you up? Um, there were things I didn't dis- didn't necessarily agree with. No, I meant, did it make you feel, oh, my God, Parliament's even worse than I thought? No, actually, not at all. all right. I have a very low expectation of right. Parliament. <laughs> so I think, I think that's more about me. Oh, but I, I thought it was great that, you know, it, it felt like there were low-hanging fruits, that things could be improved quickly within, yeah. you know, 10 years, 15 years. My lifetime, sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm 35 and I feel like, no, oh, nothing will get better. No, you're not 35. I'm 35. That's what I mean, mistaken for younger, it happens. You, you meant younger there, right? That's I what did, you meant. Yes, okay, I just, did, okay, I did. I just, just had to just check. <laughs> All right, why don't you just <laughs> reel in the compliments? Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. But, you know, and I, I sometimes genuinely have this fear that, like, you know, big changes won't, I can't see in my lifetime. Yeah. Um, because they just require too many seemingly insurmountable hills. So actually the book was gave me hope that things could be done. But there were things I didn't agree with. Now... Can we talk about second jobs and MPs? Yes. You think that some second jobs are fine. And I don't really understand. Actually, I think probably would be helpful for our listeners if you could outline your position on second jobs. Yeah. So I, I, there's a fundamentalist position on for second jobs, which is no MP should be allowed to earn any, any other money than their salary or engage in any other kind of paid employment. Uh, I understand that argument. Um, it's. I, I think it, it, it's intrinsically, it seems... Um, makes sense though, right? It, it, it makes a kind of sense. Job. It makes a kind of sense, yes. However, what what do you do about somebody who decides to write a novel um, uh, on Sunday mornings uh, mm-hmm. and uh, between five o'clock in the morning and eight o'clock? Is that problematic? I mean, a novel seems fine, isn't it? Okay, so we've got novels, <laughs> right. What about writing... <laughs> You know what I'm going to do. I'm yeah, just going yeah, to do I know this. What you're do. So, so the point is, of course, MPs okay, have to have some is- time which is their own. Okay. Um, and and I would argue incidentally about books because there's an obvious uh, hang on, yeah. Mr. Bright, you will have a second job because you've written a book yeah, and yeah, you've been yeah. paid for it. You knew it was coming. Yes, and I no, I did. It. No, no, no. And it, it's fine. And I and I refer to it in the book in the, <laughs> which I've written um, <laughs> because I think um, politics is about three things. It's about what you believe in. It's about how you put that across through mm-hmm. speeches and, and manifestos and so on. And it's about what alliances you create and um, so as to win votes, to change things. But the second bit, some sometimes if, if, if you want to make, you can make a speech in the House of Commons, nobody will notice. Yeah. You can call, you know, you can make a speech in your constituency, nobody will notice. You write a book and people notice. So it's actually part, I would argue, certainly this kind of book is very much part of doing politics. It's part, I think it's part of my job. Mm-hmm. Um, now, what about a farmer? So you you run a family farm. Right. You get elected because your constituents, you're in a rural constituency, and they go, I really rather like the fact that he's a farmer, he understand, or she is a farmer, they understand how, how the constituency works and agricultural issues and all that kind of stuff. Should the farmer, who still probably lives in the farm, not be allowed to earn any money off their farm any longer. It would be interesting to know how you would police the farmer not doing farming in their own time. That would be exactly. a question. Exactly. I mean, but are I they allowed to milk that, the cow? But if, but I, but or only the goats? But, <laughs> for the expectation that they might get, you know, staff in to cover them while they're... Like that, the idea that they... So, so you see this... So I think the issue about two jobs yeah. is different from how most people perceive it. Right. I think it's about, are you doing a proper job? Do, are you... Ever, and most voters know in a constituency 
whether somebody's swinging the lead or or really doing the job properly, you know, whether they get replies from their um, MPs uh, swiftly, whether they deal with things, whether they're present, all that kind of stuff. Um, and the second thing is whether there's a conflict of interest. So I don't think you should be allowed to have a job where there's any kind of conflict of interest between you you being a constituency MP or um, and and uh, uh, and the other job that you're taking on. So, for instance, you shouldn't be allowed to sell your knowledge as an MP. Right, because that's buying access buying completely yeah. and i think it's immoral and wrong yeah. and and we've had a sort of rule against that since 1695 when the orphans act was taken through um, but everybody's but, doing it chris well no it's actually really it's a very small number now um and the new rules that we introduced earlier on this year have tightened that and i think we should go a, a couple of steps further to tighten it even further so no directorships and things like that well look you know chris you're a, obviously a very wonderfully direct person and you talk a lot about uh, ministerial uh, impunity and ministers being able to say what they like. I mean, are we going to see a very outspoken minister if 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 Labour wins the election? I th- I think it's really important that politicians speak with honesty and integrity. And there, are, but there are times when you simply can't answer, and mm-hmm. you'd be better off saying, "Look, I'm really sorry about this. I can't answer that question because I won't be able to answer it fully and honestly." Um, and I think voters respect, um, but just as they vote, they, they re- I was on Question Time once and somebody asked me a question about something. I said, you know what? I haven't the faintest idea. I haven't got a view on this policy. I don't know any of the uh, subject matter behind it. So I'm not going to opine. Mm. And it got the biggest round of applause I've ever had on Question Time. Yeah, yeah. So I think sometimes we just need to learn that way of, um, because you know what? The one thing you can smell through a television is when a politician is just giving you the party line. Absolutely. I also wanted to, I wanted to put a political conundrum to you, right? So we get... Uh, uh, I like the word conundrum. Conundrum's a good word, yeah. So we get agony aunt and agony uncle emails in from our listeners. And we had one from Matt. So I'm, I'm going to put this to you, right? So the past year has been... Gru- this is Matt speaking, not me. Yeah. The past year has been gruelling to behold as a steadfast Labour supporter. Starmer has abandoned trans rights. You turned on lifting kids out of poverty, effectively committed to furthering economic status quo, mocked green policy. The claim that he's just posturing for the for the right leaning electorate uh, and will change once elected doesn't hold water anymore. Some months ago, Emily Thornbury told us on this podcast that there's no money left after Truss's tanking of the economy whilst re- sounding reasonable on first glance. That's not true. Edge and energy companies and banks are enjoying record profits in billions. It's shameless, patronising and insulting as the main opposition just shrug one shoulder and state that nothing can be done. Under the current Labour leadership, queer people, environmentalists and those fighting for economic prosperity and opportunities for all cannot be expected to vote Labour just because they're not the Tories. There has to be change in attitude and willpower from Starmer and his leadership. Polling numbers shouldn't be the final arbiter of policy. So I wanted to ask you what you would say to Matt, who's sort of wavering about voting Labour. I would say, first of all, um, Keir laid out when he became leader that he had to do three things. First of all, he had to detoxify the Labour Party because we were in a really, really bad way. Lots of people in my constituency in the Ronda, which is, is the only seat in Britain that has been Labour since 1885, um, they were saying, I'm not voting Labour because I'm, I just can't support the party as it is at the moment. So we had to detoxify it first. And I think we've done a good job at that. Secondly, we had to take, we had to, to prosecute the case against the Tories, which I, again, I think we've done very effectively. Everybody knows that that, you know, the country's broken. Um, it's in a terrible mess. We don't know what the financial situation is really. And you don't get to know until you're in the last few months before a general election, which is when you start writing a manifesto. But the third thing, absolutely right, perfectly fair point, is we've got to offer hope for change. And look, the Labour Party is a change party. It's about change. There's no point in the Labour Party if it isn't about change. Mm. It's got to be a passion for justice and equality and all of those things. But sometimes you also then have to go, right, there's 150 things I want to do. Which are the ones I can do in the first year or or the first week or the first hour or whatever? And which are the ones which I I know I'm going to have to leave for later? And I tell you now, between now and the general election, when we have a big poll lead, there will be lots of people who say, well, you should be much more adventurous, much bolder. You should make all sorts of public statements. You should spend money. You should announce all the spending. This is the most difficult point for a party. It's when you start making promises that you might never be able to fulfill, that's when voters really start to hate you. So I'm sorry, I'm 100% behind Keir. Um, I'm queer. 
I'm also 100% trans supportive, 100%. Uh, I also happen to know the difference between a man and a woman. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm not, all those culture wars, I think, are absolutely preposterous. Um, but of course, we've got to offer nuggets of hope. Just on the, um, qu- quickly, you know, the parliamentary reform bill, you talk about you would like to see that existing. Do you think Labour will do it? I don't know. Um, Keir came up to me today and said, "Really well done on the book." So okay. uh, I don't know what right. I don't know what that Someone's means. Got to read but it. Slightly worryingly, Michael Gove came up to me and said, "I think your book is brilliant." <laughs> so I'm not. I don't know what. I, so I suppose part of the point is I didn't want the book to be too partisan mm-hmm. because I do want change. I believe in democracy. I passionately believe. See, I. Uh, I trained to be a priest many years ago and I, part of my time I trained in Peru and then in Argentina. And in Argentina, they just had a military dictatorship mm. um, and friends of mine have been tortured. I know what the alternative to democracy is. It's authoritarian rule. And if we keep on denigrating the way politics works um, and, undermine, and, and, and tarnishing the reputation of parliament, then the danger is that people will turn to authoritarian alternatives. But I would say... Um, have hope that the Labour Party, we will lay out, I think starting with conference in a couple of weeks' time, we will be laying out a programme and people go, you know what, I want to buy a bit of that. We, it's not just that I want the Tories out. It's not just that I want to um, press the reset button. Uh, it's, it's that I actually want Labour Great. Well, listen, I think that's a wonderful place to leave this. Thank you so much, Sir Chris Bryant, the newly appointed Shadow Minister for Creative Industries and Digital Working, which I just realised maybe you're our minister. We do a podcast. Oh, maybe. Oh, great. But um, Hope you like an email. We can ditch the survey. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Save the UK is brought to you by the Human Rights Foundation. The Human Rights Foundation invites all Crooked Media listeners to join them at the 5th Oslo Freedom Forum in New York on September 28th at the Town Hall on 43rd Street. The Oslo Freedom Forum is an international human rights conference featuring talks and performances by top human rights defenders from around the world. A few of their past speakers include imprisoned Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny, Iranian journalist and activist Masay Olinajad and Karine Kanimba daughter of Paul Rusesa Bagina, the formerly detained Hotel Rwanda hero. This year, we'll hear from two survivors of China's Uyghur concentration camps, the leader of a modern-day underground railroad running from North to South Korea, and an Iranian actress, among others. Every Oslo Freedom Forum event, no matter the city, brings together a community of activists, philanthropists, technologists, artists, journalists, and policymakers, all aiming to make the world a more free and open place. Visit oslofreedomforum.com today to learn how you can attend and use the promo code OFFNYC, that's O-F-F-N-Y-C, to get a 15% discount off your ticket until the day of the event. So it's time to hand out the medals. Nish, you're kicking us off with your villain of the week. My villain of the week is absolutely, I, I would imagine, a lot of people's villain of the week. Uh, and th- That person is Jordan Henderson. He's obviously uh, been the subject of a huge transfer uh, from Liverpool Football Club uh, to the Saudi Arabian Pro League side, Al Etifak. Uh, it was a huge controversy in the summer because of Henderson's previously very public uh, support for LGBTQ causes. Um, but he uh, has returned to uh, England this week uh, for the international training camp as part of the England football team. And he gave an interview to The Athletic And as I was reading the transcription of the interview, uh, which The Athletic published in full, rather than writing it up, they published a transcription of the interview, presumably because (laughs) they assumed that if they didn't do that, people would think they were making this shit up. It's one of those things where you read an interview and halfway through you think, I don't understand why I'm now not reading the phrase. At this point, Henderson's representative (laughs) rugby tackled him, (laughs) gagged him and dragged him out of the room before he could squeeze his feet, which he should be using for other more professional purposes, directly into his mouth. It is a spectacular own goal, if I may continue the footballing analogy. Uh, First of all, he's claimed that he's gone to Saudi Arabia and it had nothing to do with the money. It had absolutely nothing to do with the money at all. But when pushed on uh, his previous support for LGBTQ causes, uh, Henderson actually came out swinging. I I honestly think that 
people would probably have less of a problem if he just came out and said, you know what, it's just all about the money. This mm-hmm. is a career for me. And, you know, he might be right to point out why are we holding footballers to a specific uh, standard of behaviour when we don't hold our governments to that kind of standard of behaviour, you know, in terms of like our government's own dealings with the Saudi Arabian government. However, instead of saying that, he tried to argue that because he's a positive person and because he's, you know, previously been an advocate for those causes, that he might actually uh, go out there and do some good, which is pretty extraordinary. Yeah. And there was this sentence that I actually think in its own perverse way might actually benefit all of us uh, in the long run in terms of what it has to say about performative activism uh, versus uh, actual engagement with causes and activist groups. He said this, uh, I have so much sympathy and the last thing I wanted to do is upset anyone who is part of the LGBTQ plus community. All I've ever do, uh, all I've ever tried to do is help. And when I've been asked for help, I've gone above and beyond to help. I've worn the laces. <laughs> I've worn the armband. I've spoken to people in that community to try and use my profile to help them. That's all I've ever tried to do. I would say that if you've gone above and beyond to help the LGBTQ community, you need to cite more examples than (laughs) I've worn the laces and I've worn the armband. It's an astonishing thing to conflate putting a piece of fabric on your arm and changing your fucking shoelaces with actual activism. And speaking of armbands, here is the video that the club put on their social media to announce Henderson's signature. Captain, who sets an example in every training session and every match. The midfielder, who made long-awaited success happen. Jordan Henderson playing at various points throughout his career, uh, culminating in his triumphant move to the uh, Saudi Pro League. Uh, However, the uh, rainbow armband that he mentioned as part of his above and beyond activism uh, was heavily greyed out. And I mean, in a sense, that's the kind of perfect encapsulation of this entire sorry affair. And and, and we're all guilty in it. We're all complicit in it. Uh, There's definitely been times in my life where I thought, of course, I'm helping. I hit a retweet. I shared a post. (laughs) But at the end of the day, if you're not going to back up your good intentions with uh, actions, especially when the whiff of huge amounts of money is in the air, you really are going to run the risk of being labelled a hypocrite. Okay, yeah, but devil's advocate, and I can't believe that I sound like I'm defending Jordan Henderson here, but he does have a point that people hold footballers and celebrities to this quite high account when we actually don't have any evidence that they are really committed to these things, that they've read a book on these things, or that they have any meaningful power for to kind of do anything. So, you know, the UK is about to host Mohammed bin Salman, uh, Saudi's ruler. It's his first official visit since the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, which US intelligence believe MBS ordered. And there's loads of people that are hypocritical about Saudi. Are we going to see the same level of anger and frustration piled on to the companies that work with them, to MPs, to government, like, you know, it, it is a bit one-sided a bit. You know, on the, uh, there's a part of me that's like, listen, we need to be balanced about this issue and we need to maybe uh, target our frustrations at more socio-politically powerful people. But on the other hand, fuck Jordan Anderson. Well, you know, it's like we say, why not do both? <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> Attack the politicians, but also him. You're completely right. You know, other listen, people really care about those causes and he just borrowed them for what? Clout? Online yeah, clout for a yeah. laugh? It's a bit rude, yeah. isn't it? What I, I will say is I have enough anger for all of these people. <laughs> I have enough rage within me to go around. There's no shortage. My my anger is a permanent renewable source of energy. If only we could work out a way to power a a, a building through my sheer, righteous, ultimately futile indignation. You know, people talk a a lot about an um, abundance mentality and normally it's about love. Actually, you know, we have deep wells of love and we can share it around. I've not really heard it about anger. And, uh, you know, maybe this is your moment. I have an abundance of hate. (laughs) My cup runneth over. Abundance of hate would be a good wrestling name for me. (laughs) Yeah, that would be good. Um... (laughs) Well, look, Coco, get us back uh, to a more positive track by naming your hero of the week, uh, who I believe is somebody who is 
absolutely pursued an extremely worthy cause. Yeah, yeah. I, oh, I don't know if I should say it's a positive story. It definitely isn't. It's it's, it's, it's heartbreaking, to be completely yeah. honest with you. But uh, she is undoubtedly a hero. She's a, a fellow journalist peer, uh, Mary P. Mills, um, basically one of the worst things that could ever happen to a person happened to her. Her daughter, Martha, was just 13 years old when a, you know, a, a cycling accident on a family holiday uh, happened. And yeah, she ended up passing away from it. And the thing that's, obviously all of it's very tragic and horrific, but one of the things that's particularly tragic is that she could have survived, you know, a uh, an investigation into her death ruled that. Um, but the care in the hospital that she was in, it just wasn't good enough. And you know, when you hear these stories about like care not being right in hospitals, NHS hospitals, you, you, we often think it must be an underfunding thing. But actually, that wasn't really the case here. Rather, what happened is just the family, they just weren't being listened to. Um, they were almost being managed so that they couldn't cause a fuss. But of course, when you do that to to, to patients and the patient's families or, or patient's carer, you, you kind of stop them from advocating for their patient. You take away a little bit of their power. As it turned out, you know, Mary P and her family were advocating for Martha, saying that she needs to be seen, she needs to be seen, and they were keeping information from them and making it harder for them to, to be heard. And in the end, sadly, the, the Mill family were right and the doctors were wrong. She did need urgent care. She didn't get it. And now she's, you know, they, they all have to live with that grief. Um, Merope is now campaigning for something called Martha's Rule, which would give patients and families the right to a second opinion from other medics in the hospital. As part of this campaign, she's pulled together models of how it can work from, you know, across the globe. She's analysed if it could overwhelm doctors and NHS trusts and the answer is not look you know it's amazing work and doing all of that through grief it is incredible I cannot possibly do justice to Mary P and Martha's and the Mills family's heartbreaking story uh, Mary P's been writing about it in The Guardian I'd really urge you to read it it's, it's a very touching read um, and she also spoke with Michelle Hussein on the Today programme it's an interview that will move you to tears uh, here's a clip now I think about her all the time every day and um, he had one of the world's greatest laughs, the sort of um, gift to the world, <laughs> her laugh. It was the sort of laugh that was an invitation to be part of whatever she was finding funny and the joy she was getting out of life. And every day I see something I want to show her or tell her just so I can see her smile like that again. I think about what she'd be doing and how much fun she would be having and how much fun she's already missed. And I hope that in having these conversations we can stop other people going through this horror. So through Merope's campaigning and of course uh, the Mills family's work around this, uh, West Streeting has confirmed that Labour will write Martha's rules into the NHS constitution and Steve Barclay said he's looking at introducing it as well. So look, those rules could take time but the fact that she did all of that, that the family did all that through that grief is just incredible and I honestly think it will change lives. I've never been in the situation that they have been, you know, thankfully, but as someone who has caring responsibilities, who's been in hospital wards, you know, families have a really crucial role, particularly when you're looking at, you know, changing staff who might not always have the full picture. Being that constant presence in the ward, you know, is valuable and you and it, it can change lives and change outcomes and, and, and that deserves to be recognised and, and for for patients and their families to be heard. Uh, so yeah, anyway, Mary P. Mills, total hero and our, our hero of the week. Lots of reaction uh, in our mailbag to last week's interview with Matt Shea, the documentary filmmaker who took us into the murky world of misogynist Andrew Tate. So Sam from West Virginia has also emailed in. He says he's seen Tate pop up in his nephew's social feeds and has tried to talk to him about it, but is worried that he will he'll end up just denouncing him too emphatically. Uh, his nephew will no longer be comfortable asking him questions. Sam says until recently he'd given up on trying to define healthy masculinity as it reinforces a binary notion of gender um, that he thinks is demonstrably wrong. But he says... If people like us abandon the field, then many young men will simply seek answers to their questions about masculinity from phonies like Tate. So what do I want to tell my nephew about what it means to be a good man? For me, it means caring about other people. It means empathising with folks who have 
completely different life experiences than mine. It might also mean being brave, but not necessarily in the cartoonish action hero sense. Instead, for me, bravery might just mean sharing some part of me that I am afraid to show someone else. P.S. In the wildly unlikely event that any of you ever visit West Virginia, let me know and I'll take you hiking or rafting. What a nice offer. Yeah, I thought that was a really, uh, it's a really interesting uh, thing from Sam. Thanks very much for contacting us. And I really think, yeah, defining uh, what masculinity looks like and also considering a different version of what bravery looks like and allowing it to encompass things like emotional openness and uh, willingness to discuss mental health is a really, really important thing. I would say if we do end up in West Virginia and we do end up on a hiking rafting trip, I will not be an asset to that trip. I think Coco <laughs> will be great. I would suggest we all get together you and Coco go off for a hike and a raft and I'll meet you in a bar afterwards. Yeah, yeah. You know, as you say, there's different ways to show bravery, isn't there, Nish? And go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see you doing it there. Um, like, just this is an aside, but I actually really would like to do something like that in America. So if any of our listeners have any uh, suggestions, like I really want to do the sort of, you know, America, yeah, I really want to do those sort of experiences, like see some trucks fight each other or something. Do you think no, that? I got no interest. And I'll tell you why I've got no interest. Uh, I uh, I have no interest in white water rafting because when I was a kid, one of the films me and uh, my brother and my parents would watch over and over again is The River Wild, which is what I imagine a very, very serviceable 1990s thriller. And I'll be honest with you, it doesn't look fun. Uh, as soon as we got out white water rafting, I'd be worried about being taken hostage by Kevin Bacon. That would be my number one concern. Let's finish with a marketing suggestion from at Andrew McColl, who says, is it wrong that I want Coco to do Nadine Dorries' audiobook in a Jason Statham voice? I'm sure its content would destroy my sanity, but it would be a hell of a way to go. <laughs> oh, that's really not. Surely it would be better to get actual Jason Statham to do it. Listen, What's I don't he up know. To at the minute? Is he doing much? <laughs> yeah, he's got. he's always got a film coming out. It constantly, the man is an absolute sausage factory of <laughs> solid action thrillers. Um, if anyone does have an in with Jason Statham and would be willing to have him read small sections of Nadine Doris's book out, we would be happy to uh, broadcast. Do that. we know that he's on? Is he on cameo? Do we know? I think that's I, that for us. That's a piece I, of work for us to do, Nish. I imagine if Statham is on Cameo, that's a really, really extremely expensive Cameo. Okay, so anyway, next crowdfunder for Pod Save <laughs> the UK will do a whip round to get Jason Statham to do some clips. That seems like a good use of money. If we have a whip round for anything, it's surely got to be to try and pay for a porter cabin at a kid's school. Yes. Like, I really feel like, given that we talked about all the money that's been wasted, the worst thing we could do is go, and uh, now if you'd like to donate to our crowdfunder to get Jason <laughs> Statham to read out a bit of what I imagine will be the worst book written in the English language, please donate here. You can get in touch with us by emailing psuk at reducelistening.co.uk. You can also send us a voice note on WhatsApp. Our number is 07514 644 572. Internationally, that's plus 44 7514 644 572. I reckon in a few more episodes I'll have this memorised, you know. This is the only number that I say out loud, unless it's like 111, maybe occasionally. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on what we've discussed on this episode, or you can nominate your own heroes and villains, or just ask us a question, uh, you know, as your favourite political agony aunt and uncle. Uh, email us at psuk at reducelistening.co.uk. Pod Save the UK is a reduced listing production for Crooked Media. Thanks to senior producer Musty Aziz and digital producer Alex Bishop. Video editing was by David Kaplovitz and the music is by Vasilis Fotopoulos. Thanks to our engineer, David Dargahi. The executive producers are Louise Cotton, Dan Jackson and Madeline Herringer with additional production support from Ari Schwartz. Watch us on the Pod Save the World YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter, TikTok or Instagram where we're at Pod Save the UK. And hit subscribe for new shows on Thursdays on Spotify, Amazon or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts.